Hi everyone, my name is Akash, I'm the founder of Mind the Bleep and thank you so much for coming today. Massive apologies for everything that happened last time, as you know it was out of our control, but fortunately Josie has done an amazing job of, um, I think she's doing this just before her nights as well, she's really pulling out all of the stops to get this session to you guys to make sure that we're helping you as much as that, as much as we can. Um, so for those who don't know, Josie is a FY2 at Imperial NHS Foundation Trust. The reason that she's giving this talk is she came um, in the top 5% of the SJT, which is an outstanding feat. And so we want to make sure that you're getting all the right tips. Um, outside of this, um, we've got plenty of other final year content, um, which we put. I put the link down. Um, please sign up to the mailing list and let us know what kind of final year content you'd like. We're shortly going to be advertising regional representatives and um, medical school representatives. So if you join that mailing list, um, you'll be able to apply for that role. And I've also pasted our YouTube channel where we'll be uploading this content afterwards. Once again, thank you so much for joining. It's amazing to see over 250 people um, joining this session. I'll hand it over to Josie. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Um, sorry, I was just sharing the, the slides um, full uh, full page. Sorry, there's a small issue with that. Um, so what I'd like to do is just introduce myself first. I'm Josie, as you say, I'm a, a FY2 at Imperial. A few sponsors to thank for this talk. We've got Wesleyan and also we've got the MDU. And um, as recommended here, you will need membership um, as a junior doctor. And so the MDU is quite good and that gives you a free gift. So that's myself. Um, as I say, I trained at UCL and um, I scored in the top 5%. And SJT is unfortunately a fair bit to do with luck, but I do think there is a bit of training that can be done. So hopefully today will help with that. So today's webinar, what we're going to cover is, first of all, an overview of the types of questions that you get in the SJT and how they're scored, top tips for the SJT, and how to approach the following themes, prescription errors, discharging patients, maintaining work-life balance, prioritising jobs and team working. And then we've got another talk on the 24th of November where I've categorised other themes that come up quite a lot in the SJT and that, I'd, um, that we're going to run through with some questions. So there are five core domains to the SJT. The first is commitment to professionalism, coping with pressure, effective communication, patient focus, and that's pretty much probably the number one thing to focus on, um, and working effectively as part of a team. If you focus on these five things, then you won't go too far wrong in any of the questions. So the structure of the SJT, this is taken from the official website, um, so if anyone knows of anything different, do let me know, because um, as far as I know, this is still the official structure, um, unless they haven't updated it this year. So untimed non-disclosure agreement five um, at the start of the talk, at the start of your slides when you go into the exam. Then you have five minutes to do an optional tutorial to help you navigate how to do the test. It's probably worthwhile doing that just to make sure you feel comfortable and have time to gather your thoughts before you start. And then once it starts, you've got 140 minutes to do two sections. Section one is 70 minutes and it's got a part A and a part B. The part A is a multiple choice questions and we'll go through what that involves. And part B is rating questions. Then you've got an optional 10 minute break. And then the second part, which is ranking questions, that's part C. Then at the end, you've got an optional survey so they can see how people found it to do the exam. OK, so on average, we'd recommend about 90 seconds per question. And that's what we'll be doing tonight with the practice questions we're doing. It's important to say that you can't revisit section A once you start section B. OK, so this is the marking explained. And again, it's a screenshot taken from the official website. So rating questions, which came out in 2021, I think my year was the first to do them, you're asked whether to to rank whether a response to a situation is very appropriate, somewhat appropriate, somewhat inappropriate or inappropriate. And each correct option that you put down is worth four marks. So the maximum you could get per scenario would be 32 marks. Each question also gives you um, near miss scoring. So if you're 
if you write somewhat appropriate instead of appropriate, then you get three marks instead of four. These questions can be actions, spe speech responses, or things to consider. So how important is this for consideration? Very important, important, some, and so on. Currently, there are no official questions for this with uh, official answers on the website, um, which is slightly irritating. But the best thing to do is to do the official practice question on the website, which doesn't have the answers, just so at least you're familiar with the format. And with the other two types of questions, the, the principles are the same. So don't get too worried about it. So the second um, question mentioned here is ranking. So your responses are marked compared to a response to a model response determined by an expert panel. The closer your response is to the model response, the more marks you're awarded. And again, each correct option um, is worth four marks. And that's ra that's ranking um, that's ranking five options. So the most you can get if you get all of them in the right answer in the right order is 20 marks. And again, you get the near miss marks. And then finally, there's multiple choice where you pick three, the three most appropriate actions or responses out of an option of about eight. And for that, you get four marks per correct option you pick. So the total marks for those questions are 12. So we'll do a combination of the ranking and multiple choice today. In terms of scoring, the score is out of 50. The average score in 2020 was 39.85. And the thing that probably why most of you are here is because this exam is worth 50% of your university mark. So what's called the educational performance measure, your decile at university is equivalent to this exam. Okay, top tips for our vision. Do the official mocks. There's two practice papers with answers on the, on the official website. And I would recommend doing them at least twice. I think I did them about three times. So I did it first on my own. And then I got into a group of with four people. And we each took turns doing, say, 10 of the questions per week, and then regrouping and going through why we each put that answer and trying to un unpick what the answers mean. Because although there are answers, they're not always that useful, or sometimes they contradict each other, it seems like. So it's good to go through it. And that's what we're hoping to do today. Be familiar with the glossary at the start of these practice papers. You'll see it goes through certain acronyms or certain terms. You don't want to be trying to understand those terms on the day when it's very easy to just be familiar with it. Go through it in your own time before the exam. As I say, getting into groups is really helpful. Picking out the key themes, which is what I've tried to do in this um, two part webinar, um, just to see how the SJT handles them, because there are recurring themes that come up and I've, I've highlighted which questions they come up in the official papers and just understanding how the SJT recommends going about them. Reading GMC Good Medical Practice, very, very important, essential reading for this exam. And then another one that not everyone knows about is GMC Scenarios in Practice. So if you type in GMC Scenarios in Practice on Google, it will come up with a GMC website and it's got official advice and gives you booklets on, thing, on key themes like confidentiality, gift receiving, um, and a whole host of other things are really helpful. Um, and also gives you uh, scenarios where it will tell you about a patient and you have to give multiple choice answers. It's a bit long. A lot of these booklets are maybe five pages. Some of them are 10, some are longer. But it's worth reading through because theoretically any answers to the SJT come from this source. So it's you might as well read why they where their reasoning comes from. And also it's it's useful as being a junior doctor to know what you should be doing in each situation. And um, stick to timings, very important. I would practice the past papers under time if you can, and we're gonna practice the timings today. And remember that you're answering as an FY1 doctor, not as a final year medical student. There's no negative marking. So answer every question, even if you're at the end of the exam, you run out of time, just try and put an answer down. So those are my top tips. And now on to recommended sources, because we often get asked this. Official past papers are the number one thing, as is the official advice from the GMC. If you can't do anything else, I would highly, uh, highly recommend those sources. Generally, I'd, um, I would avoid unofficial resources. I started doing a few myself, but I didn't find them that helpful. And sometimes they contradict what's in the official past papers. So it's better to stick to those, but I'll just go through some anyway. So 
as I say, these are the main ones to use. And you can see what I was talking about, the GMC advice. I used this one, to, um, 250 SJTs, um, which I found quite helpful. But any other sources you use, I would use with a pinch of salt and recognize that these three are the ones that you want to be focusing on. And then I also use the um, Oxford Assess and Progress. But again, that's just extra. And I really would recommend doing the official sources more than anything. So in this paper, uh, in this talk, rather than making up my own questions, which I did consider doing, I realized that's somewhat hypocritical because I recommend using the, the official resources. So I thought it'd be more useful. I've picked out five questions with different themes from the official practice papers which I want us to go through so you, you might know the answer to some but I think it's helpful and it certainly would be counterintuitive for me to make up some questions so without further ado we'll do our first question and I'll open the poll Okay, we'll stop the poll there. It's been about 90 seconds. So most people have put down E, B, D, C, A. Really well done. That is the correct answer. So this question focuses on pre prescription errors, which is something that comes up multiple times in the SJT practice papers. So let's go through the answer. The first one is that with any problems of a prescription, or if you've been asked to write a prescription, you want to try and contact the person who wanted the prescription, normally your consultant or your registrar, because they may know of a contraindication when requesting you to prescribe, and they have information which you might not be aware of, or the pharmacist might not be aware of, or they might know an appropriate alternative because they've asked you to do it. It's probably something that they prescribe every day, and they'll know what's the best options. So either way, if someone's asked you to do something that's now unsafe, they need to know. Or for example, if the patient's about to go to surgery and the patient needs to have uh, the antibiotic beforehand, you can't just sit on that because it could delay the surgery, for example. Secondly, asking for another senior's advice is also very helpful. For example, if you ask your reg when your consultant's asked you to do something and you can't get hold of your consultant, your reg might be able to. So really important, but better to speak to the person who initially asked you, if you can. Discussing with a warm pharmacist, you'd think is a really good option, and it is, except that, as we as we said before, you, you need to talk to the person who's asked you to prescribe it because they might know extra information that the pharmacist doesn't know about, for example, certain contraindications, um, certain reasons why this, there's certain studies why this antibiotic's better in this trial, or the things that they've, they've thought about when they ask for that specific prescription that the pharmacist and you won't know about. You also shouldn't go against their explicit wish without speaking to them. Um, declining to prescribe could be unsafe for the patient if they need this prescription or if they need a similar medication. Generally, doing nothing is not a good option. 
And then finally, writing up a drug but omitting the start time is very, very unsafe. Never do that. Um, especially online prescribing, you, it won't even give you the option to do that. So it's not an option at all. Hopefully that makes sense why we go with the seniors and then the pharmacist. Okay, so I went through the questions that come up in practice paper one and two, and you can see here, I've written them out, which ones had this sort of prescription errors theme. And this is the general recommended order I can get from it. So first of all, speak to the prescriber or the person who's asked you to prescribe it about an error. For example, if someone's prescribed something that doesn't seem safe, you need to speak to them urgently. Discuss with a senior, then discuss with a pharmacist. Avoid changing doses yourself, um, but if it's the case of something is potentially unsafe, for example, if it looks like something is a double dose instead of a single dose and you can't work out why, you can't get hold of the prescriber, it would be better to reduce it to a single dose rather than doing nothing. Okay, hopefully that makes sense, but I'll just check if there's any questions on that. Yes, these are from the UK FPO's past papers. As I say, I, I considered writing my own questions, but that seems counterintuitive when my own reasoning could be wrong. And I think it's helpful to go through the reasoning of the official papers. Okay, so on to question two, and I will open the poll. Really well done, everyone. Okay, really good. I'll stop there because that's been about 90 seconds. So most people, 71% have gone for E, B, C, A, D. Is the correct answer. So well done, everyone. So this question, the theme is discharging patients. Um, and I've seen a question in the, in the chat, which I will come back to in a minute. Um, so discharging patients, also a very common theme that comes up in the practice papers. So in this question, there's a patient who was ready to go home, but now doesn't want to go home because they say it's too late, it's 6 p.m. We need to address what are the key issues um, to deal with and how we should go about this. First one is speak to the patient first. So ask them why they don't want to leave. There might be a very good reason. For example, they don't have their house keys. They um, have a care package that isn't set up, so they can't go home now. Um, they are becoming more unwell. Maybe they've started, they've developed something else that wasn't there earlier in the day. Or it might be something simple that can be fixed with communication. For example, they want a relative to come with them home. We can easily call their, their daughter or son or whoever and get them to come in to take them home. So always ask the patient first. It might be a very reasonable thing that you can help with. Secondly, trying to assist their discharge. Um, again, so this is to do with question one and that 
see if there's any way that we can help them, such as helping to get them transport home. A lot of patients, um, for example, I work in A&E at the moment, and we have some quite elderly patients who say they don't want to go home, but their main concern is that they don't want to have to get on the bus or they don't feel steady enough to to try and organise their own way home. But if we organise transport for them, they feel quite happy with that. Asking the bed manager for a patient to stay another night is not great because it's not in the patient or the hospital's interest. The hospital will have lots of patients who need beds. Um, at the moment, there's always bed crisis going on. It's also not in the patient's interest because if they don't need to be in hospital and they're staying longer than they need to be. They, that causes more muscle wasting and there's also the risk of them catching infections. Looking for an excuse to keep the patient. So this question where it says go through the notes and look for a reason for them to stay is what the SJT sees as the same as looking for an excuse to keep the patient. And the way we can say that is because in the question it says that the patient was ready to go. Let's look at the exact wording. It says here, um, there are no medical reasons why Jane should stay in hospital overnight. If the question is telling you something like that, then you have to take it at face value. So don't go looking for reasons. There might be something that you find from four days ago, which might now be resolved. And then finally, telling the patient we need a bed is unkind and it's not a good reason. If a patient needs to be in hospital and we found a reason why they have to be in hospital, telling them that we need the bed is not helpful. Um, and it might stop the patient from sharing very valid concerns as to why they should stay longer. Maybe that makes sense. Um, and then just the general principles for discharging patients. First of all, try to understand the patient's point of view. Secondly, um, as an F1, you don't discharge patients without senior supervision. So if there's anything saying senior can't come in to review, what do you do? The answer is not discharge them yourself unless you've been told to. Um, avoid encouraging self-discharge because it's generally not the safe, safe option for the patient, but you can't keep patients against their will but avoid encouraging it. Um, generally, don't keep patients longer than they need to be. And certainly do not tell them that you need the bed. So you can see here other questions in the practice papers, which also relate to discharging patients. I just want to go back to this question. Someone said, should we be analysing the UK FPO questions as I've done? The important thing is that I think there are themes that come up again and again and they generally have the same format for answering them which is why I'm trying to go through that in this um, webinar and the next one so hopefully I kind of done that for you hopefully that's helpful um, but it's also worth realizing that it's not like other medical school exams where you can pattern recognize because simple wording changes in the questions mean that a whole different answer is applicable so I think it's generally useful having an idea how you approach different types of themes like discharging patients, but be very aware of the wording of questions. Okay, question three.
Okay, I'll stop the poll there. Well done, we've got more than 200 answers. Okay, so this question, I've seen that most people have put down the correct answer, so really well done. 96% of you have put down B, A, C, D, E. So you're absolutely right, but I'll go through the answer anyway. Um, first of all, patient safety is number one priority. So any question that relates to this, saying it's unsafe for a patient to do this, is, is going to be the first consideration. Secondly, your own well-being is important, not as important as patient safety, but they do impact each other. So the focus on this second bit, the impact on your own well-being, if no time for rest, also affects patient care, but not as clearly as the first answer. Your right to finish work on time is important. And then the last two are not really important. So your consultant giving you a bad reference should not affect how you treat patients or how you do your everyday work. And the fact that you're always cancelling on friends, unfortunately, your social life does not influence, should not influence your work. And the SJT will not put your social life first in any questions. So um, those are actually the main things to think about when answering any question looking at work-life balance. And this, I think, is the only question out of the past papers that addresses that, but I thought it was important to go through. So I'll just check if there's any questions. Um, someone asked, although the practice papers on the website don't have an answer, would they still provide us a result? As far as I remember from doing it two years ago, I don't think they do, which is very frustrating. It might have changed since then, though. I haven't sat down and done the two-hour exam since. So if anyone else knows, do, do respond. No, you didn't get a result. Yeah, it was very frustrating. But I think it's helpful to go through the format anyway. Okay, on to question four. Okay, that's been about 90 seconds, so I'll just stop the poll. We've got more than 250 answers, so really well done. Most people have gone with BDE, and a third of people have gone with DEF. So really well done, BDE is the correct answer. So the, the theme of this one, or the theme that I I think it gets to, is the prioritising of jobs. So. Let's go through the answers. It's standard practice in SJT land for nurses to update relatives. So it's very acceptable for you to ask a nurse to do that. That's worth knowing in SJT land because you might not know that as a, as a medical student. Um, and certainly on the ward, and the nurses do a lot of the updating. If it's something, um, if they want a more, um, if there's something complex that the nurses can't necessarily explain, then you might be asked to do it. Finishing the most important clinical tasks and then handing over any urgent uncompl uncompleted tasks is standard practice. So generally, we don't hand over anything unless it has to be done that day. You would, If it's something routine that can be done the next day, then you do that. Um, anything that has to be done absolutely that second, you do. But anything that has to be done within the next few hours, you can hand over. Um, 
generally don't hand over non-urgent things to the night team. They won't thank you. Asking FY1 to help is um, very valid and very important, but only if they finish their own urgent tasks. Um, so together, these three answers make the perfect answer because it deals with all parts of the question, which is the main thing. So asking the nurses to, to, to update the relatives deals with that issue. You've also got the issue that you're not going to finish on time regardless. So how are you going to address that? Ask a colleague to help and hand over anything that needs to be handed over. And putting those three together, you get a good answer. In general, this is from the official website, in general, clinical tasks, such as assessing patients, are more important than operational tasks like paperwork. The important thing with these multiple choice questions is realising that no single answer, um, no single part of the answer stands alone. You have to put it together with the rest of it. So if you have two, if you select two answers that say the opposite thing, for example, asking the relative, uh, sorry, asking the nurse to update the relative, and then you also select, tell them that you'll update the relative in five minutes. Those two answers wouldn't go together because they contradict each other. Okay, so things to think about when working under pressure and prioritising job tasks. Patient safety, as always, is number one. If you're busy with one patient and a nurse or anyone else asks you to review another, you can ask for a set of observations whilst you're finishing your current job and that will help you when you get around to um, seeing them straight after. Do not, in general, do not reassure nurses about patients that they're coming to you saying they're worried about unless you have reviewed them. So even if you reviewed them five hours ago and they were fine, if a nurse is coming to you now worried about them, you need to see that patient. It's not safe to say, oh, don't worry, they were fine five hours ago. Always work within the remat of what you're trained to do. And we'll look at this a bit more on the second part of, um, on the 24th, on the second part of this webinar. If you're on a break when called to a medical emergency, you need to attend the medical emergency in SJT land. So um, there are some questions that relate to this. In real life, most likely, if there's a medical emergency, there'll be someone else who can who can look after it. But in SJT land, if there's a medical emergency, you can't assume that there's someone else able to attend. So you need to attend. And generally, don't get a senior until you've done your initial assessment. If a nurse is saying, I'm worried about this patient, you should go see that patient, do your A to E, and then if you're worried, contact your senior as soon as you have good reason as to why you need senior input. Don't delay it, but until you've actually assessed the patient yourself, you can't just call a senior and say, nurse is worried about a patient, I'm going to see them now. Um, you need to see them yourself first. So I've again highlighted questions that relate to prioritising tasks and working under pressure in the two past papers. Okay, feedback time. And then we have one more question. So if people could very kindly scan this QR code and give some feedback, and I'll just give you two minutes to do that. Um, I don't get, um, as you know, like the, with these webinars, we all do it in our spare time, um, in our free time. And so feedback is really helpful to help us make it better for next time.
Okay, I'll just give it another 30 seconds. Please do put down feedback. Um, it's really helpful. And it gives us an incentive to continue doing these talks and find out what works and what doesn't work. Okay, I'll just answer a few questions in the um, chat and then we'll do the last question. Why wouldn't updating the senior about not being able to complete the task be an important thing to do as well? It would be important, but it's not dealing with the issue. So you need to try and complete the task within, within the time frame, if possible. So there are other things you can do. And in general, you're not gonna finish everything by the end of the day as an F1. So do the urgent things and hand over what's what needs to be done that evening and getting an F1 colleague so to help you. You need to try and address the issue before telling a senior that you aren't able to complete them. Uh, can we go back to, can we go three slides back? One, two, three. And that's the question. I'll just leave that there whilst I answer the question. Um, so the MCQs are always answered together. So in the multiple choice part, part B of the SJT is mul um, multiple choice part. You pick three answers out of eight and that forms a complete response to the question. Uh, I was under the impression that pushing tasks onto other colleagues isn't the best option, but is it different here as you are the prioritizing other tasks? So when you say pushing tasks onto other colleagues, I don't know if you mean handing over or getting an F1 colleague to help you, but if your F1 colleague has completed their tasks and is available, then you can get them to work with you. In general, on award, there'll be about three F1s um, and you all do the same, you all share the same jobs. And um, handing over to night team any urgent task that has to be done that evening is standard practice, so that's fine. Um, okay, so exactly, yeah, well done. Okay, so final question, question five, and then I'll stick around if there's any questions. Really well done, you guys are doing so, so well on these answers. Oh, sorry. I'm mean, no question by this open. Okay, we'll stop it there. That's 90 seconds. So most people have gone with ABD. That's 80% of people, really well done. And that is the correct answer. So this question gets at teamwork and communication. 
and how you best um, deal with those. So let's go through the main answers. Speaking to a colleague directly, asking your FY1 colleague who's checking their personal emails. You can assume that they're not particularly busy if they're checking personal emails. So just ask them if they mind helping today. It's very non-confrontational uh, non um, and it's the right thing to do. Inform your registrar that you're very busy and may need some help. As your senior, they need to know that you're busy and be aware of your workload. This is different to saying, um, I'm not going to be able to finish it by the end of the day. You're just letting them know so that if they try to give you more jobs, they have a realistic idea of whether those will be done or not. And then talking to your consultant about the uneven, uneven workload is also appropriate because this is the only way to sort the issue in the long term. The first two will help for today, but you need to find a long term solution. And it's not the same as reporting on your FY1 colleague because it's not their fault that that you have more jobs than they do. That's just the way that the road has been organised. And obviously, if you don't raise it, then it's not going to be resolved. It's also worth mentioning that mentioning it at the departmental meeting is not appropriate because you need to go to your senior first and have a private discussion rather than bringing it up at a departmental meeting. That's not an appropriate place to discuss these things. You should try and contact the individuals involved first. OK, so principles of teamwork and communication. There's a few questions in the SJT practice papers which talk about being bullied or undermined. And the main thing that comes out of them is that you don't want to delay addressing the issue. More particularly, if there's an issue between a nurse and a patient, then you inform the senior nurse. So if you're not involved, but you've seen it happen, you speak to the senior nurse. However, if there's an issue between you and a nurse, and um, the examples they give are of nurses undermining you, then you need to inform your consultant. So if you're not really involved, you inform the senior nurse if it's about a nurse. If you are involved, then you need to inform your own senior. If a colleague is left for a learning opportunity, but you're not coping with the workload about them, then you need to ask them to return. So you should always attend your FY1 teaching. But if, for example, they've gone to theatre to scrub in to help out on a surgery when they don't really need to, it's it's a learning opportunity for them, which is valuable. But if you're not coping with the workload and it's potentially unsafe for a patient, then you need to ask your colleague to return. Reporting colleagues is a last resort. You should try and talk to the colleague first, talk to your seniors first. In general, things like reporting to the GMC are not going to be the right answer unless it's a very, very, very serious issue. And then questions that relate to this are there. There's quite a few of them. And in general, you can see that they'll follow the same principles that I've, outlaid, uh, I've outlined here. OK, so that's the end of the lecture. Um, I'll stick around to answer some questions. But you can see here the second part of the lecture will be on the 24th for an hour. And that is going to address um, quite a few different issues, such as um, oh, I've written out. But, um, I've got about seven other themes I want to go through. And we've already talked through the SJT out, out um, the structure of the SJT. And so this will just be more questions and theme answers um, getting straight to it. OK, I will have a look at questions. Thank you, Josie. Um, whilst you're looking at the questions, I will just quickly um, direct everybody's attention to a cash me message. So I'm the final year's lead. We're looking for final year medical students to join and become medical student reps for our final year series. Um, the link for the application is in the chat um, and really looking forward to see your applications. I will hand it back to Josie for the questions. Thanks, Dennis. Um, question two about the patient discharge. For option A, going through James Medical Notes to check there are no outstanding medical issues. Why would that not be considered an act to find an excuse to, find, to keep the patient longer? Um, so, as I said, in the question, they specifically say there are no medical reasons why Jane should stay in hospital overnight. So if they're telling you that, you need to take it at face value you don't assume that there are more reasons. And if you go through the notes, there might be old reasons from a few days ago. It's not very helpful for the here and now. 
hopefully that helps answer it. Yes, uh, the recording will go on the YouTube channel, which Akash uh, posted at the top of the chat. Uh, if they're dealing with a theatre, uh, a patient in theatre or the ward is calling them appropriate. Good question. So in general, in surgery, um, I did a surgical job last year, your reg and your consultant will nearly always be in, in, in theatre. So they need to know what's going on on the wards and it's kind of um, based on preference. Some will want to know more than others. Um, but uh, you go through here the important issues. If you have a lot of work and you're not going to finish on time, then your senior needs to know. So in that case, it is appropriate. Um, if there's an emergency on the ward, you'd also need to tell them because they need to come out of theatre to come help. And you can always, there's a phone within the theatre, so you can always call without them having to scrub out to talk to you. Question five. So question 5H, hand over remaining jobs to the on-call team at the end of shift. It's a good question. Um, so that doesn't deal with the issue that um, this and uh, the long-term part of the issue as well. Um, so you have a colleague who's not doing work, who's on the ward, reading personal emails, who could be helping you. So handing over jobs to the on-call team when you already have someone available with you who could help is not the best option. There will be some nuances where if you didn't have that colleague who was there to help, then of course you need to hand over. Um, but first, we need to try and do as many of them as you can first. Can FY1s complete take texts? I believe so. I never actually did one, but I believe so. When is it appropriate as an FY1 to delegate tasks to your colleagues? So in general, you wouldn't delegate to anyone older, anyone more senior than you, unless it's an emergency and you need help from a senior. You would delegate to other F1s if you can. Would asking your colleague for help and asking your consultant for help be addressing the same issue twice? Um, I think you're talking about question five. So. In this case, you're asking your colleague to help because they're not doing anything and you need help. And then you're asking your consultant about how to resolve this issue in the long term. So both of those answers are important for short term solution and long term solution. Uh, when is it appropriate for F1s to do a day text? There's probably something on the GMC about this. But in general, day texts are when there are mistakes that could have been avoided. So, for example, a patient is prescribing medication that they're allergic to, that's a never event, definitely needs a day text. Is it okay to ask someone else from another team to help you? Um, generally not if they've got their own jobs to do, but in this case, they're on the same ward as you and they are not doing anything else. So yes, it would be appropriate. But if they end um, in FY1 land, um, breast surgery and general surgery tend to go together. So you're kind of part of the same team. Can we go back to the last reasoning, please? Yeah, great. Thanks, Raul. So you can do days at Texas as a medical student, so definitely is an F1. Why, in question five, is it okay to go to both your consultant and specialty registrar? Would you go to the specialty registrar first for workload issues? So question five is getting at, in the immediate, you need to tell your registrar that you've got a lot of work on and that's for the here and now, but then you need to tell your consultant at your next meeting at some point, not right now, it's not going to help today, but you need to tell them that there is an issue with the workload, so that can be dealt in the long term. So they're both important for the short term and long term. When would you speak to a nurse in charge over the registrar? If you see a nurse being rude to a patient or you're worried about a nurse's contact but you're not involved then you need to speak to the nurse in charge and um, if you are involved in some conflict between you and a nurse then you need to tell your consultant. 
is the answer ever delegate to a medical student? Generally, no. I think there's one example of um, a patient who needs to be reviewed in one of the practice papers where it says the, the medical student can go review them whilst you're finishing off some bloods. If it's um, doing a history or an exam, the medical students can do that, but do not hand over routine jobs for medical students. It's not helpful for their learning and it's not very safe. So generally I would avoid delegating to medical students. Can we ask for medical students help if we're busy? I think so. I think that would be fine, but don't ask them to do jobs that you should be doing yourself. Um, it's more, <laughs> yes, Dennis says, it's more about what's helpful for their learning. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending.